Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to In the Cubby Hole with me, Niall. And me, James. We are today going to, well, we're going to talk about a lot of things, but the first thing we want to cover is the Elite Dangerous Odyssey expansion DLC. What yeah, it's a um, expansion for Elite Dangerous, um, basically adding a lot of things to the game, really. Um, we're talking about adding uh, atmospheric landings and whatnot and, you know, planetary flight um, on a scale that we've not really seen before, really. Um, or, you know, any of you that have kind of played games such as Elite have known that uh, it's it's featured a lot of, like, expansive things, you know, you've been able to do anything, fly across the galaxy and... Um, you know, it's it's a huge scale game, but for me, what I kind of missed a little bit was um, just the feel that you could truly go anywhere. Um, you could land on planets, um, on moons and whatnot without atmospheres, but you just couldn't really get a feel for, um, you know, the, the more terrestrial planets in a way. I, I do always feel playing elite, like I play effectively as a smuggler and I always feel as though there's not that level of immersion that you want to where as I'm a smuggler I want to be able to land and go and chat to people and say oh, I've got got this on slide you want yeah. to buy this like whereas that's not the case in Elite it's it's very there is a obviously it's a very in-depth game but the fact that they're adding planetary landings and the fact you can go out on foot on these planets it's actually giving you a bit more of an expansive sort of universe that allows you to explore the the more in depth, like like the 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 little intricate parts of of a planet. Like it's all well and good me landing on a planet, sticking my vehicle out and driving around. Yeah, yeah. But I can't jump out and explore. Oh yeah, there's a crater there. Let me have a look at it. There's a this there. I want to have a look at that. Mm. And I, I think, think that's yeah. what will be good about them adding that. For me, um, unless you have a VR headset, um, for Elite Dangerous, it's kind of difficult to kind of get a feel for the actual scale of the game, because you're flying around at such high speeds, you know, faster, many times faster than the speed of light even. Um, you feel like objects that would normally take like years to fly by, or at least, you know, even days at, at really high speeds, um, take just, you know, even seconds or even less. And... Um, having the choice to like walk around um, and be able to kind of get a real feel for the size of what you truly are walking around on, it'd be a really good thing. Especially when Elite has such high quality competition nowadays, such as Star Citizen, which is definitely a very high detail game. You can walk around and you can even you know, talk to people in that game, you can play online, you can meet other players, it's a very, like, interactive game. It's something that's been in development for quite a few years now, um, funded purely by the players. Uh, you buy packs and stuff like that, you buy uh, skins and all sorts of microtransactions that um, are used to fund the game. And, you know, it's, it's showing a lot of promise, but unlike Elite, um, there's no real solid release date for when it's going to come out and nobody really knows. People are just playing the game now in an, in an unfinished state. And it's not really, you know, it's not enough for a lot of people. See, so, yeah, I do feel like that's that's sort of been a, a problem with a, a, a lot of games as well that, that aren't maybe funded by either big studios or, or at least studios that have got a bit of a backing behind them. Um, I always tend to find that they don't really go into the intricacies of that side of things. Like they, they're always, oh yeah, we'll we'll push the gate out as soon as we can. Uh, uh, game out, sorry, gate. Uh, the game out as soon as we can, and just see how people react to it. Like you look mm. at you look at games such as EA uh, when EA took over the Star Wars Battlefront series, the Star Wars Battlefront Two, Star Wars yeah. Battlefront One. They both flopped massively. Because they didn't listen to what people wanted. Yeah. They then went in with Star Wars Battlefront 2. They they changed so much stuff. They've started adding more and more and more. And it's got to a point where the game is actually playable again. Oh, yeah. It's a really fun game nowadays. I've actually... Um, my mate's got it on PS4. And every now and then I've played it. And 
just had an absolute blast. Like, you know, you can play a mission or an online game for up to like 40 minutes and it genuinely feels like you're on a mission. You, you genuinely feel like you're actually saving your crew from like an invasion. That's what and you want. You want the role play aspect yeah. of a game now. The immersion. Just, especially when you're say, like, like Elite Dangerous, like you've just said Star Citizen. I've not played Star Citizen like in Unfinished State or whatever. But what you want from that type of game is because it's effectively an MMO, but without the the directive like you're not being told or oh, do this, do that, do this, do there's yeah. there's no linear story to follow mm. as such. You need that role play aspect and I think that is where some games don't hit the mark. Yeah. People like that variety nowadays. I think Elite Dangerous has got everything you want to a degree. And like I can play, I can go on and I I role play a smuggler. James is more of an explorer. He, he was mm. the one that got me into it. Elite Dangerous in fairness. Oh yeah, big on exploring me. I like that high jump range. <laughs> you know, there's a jump all the way across like the whole bubble in one go. Fifty light years or more. Pew. And I I thought oh, I'll have a crack at a smuggler. I'm terrible at aiming. I'm terrible at, at FPS games. That's it's difficult. Yeah. That's the problem I have. Whereas it's easy on Elite. Whereas I can jump in, I can say, oh, I'm going to be a smuggler. But like mm. I said earlier, I want the ability to then say, I'm going to I'm gonna try and sell this stuff to, to someone that's not the, the actual star port. I want to be able to explore and say, I've got this for trade, let's, let's do a deal on it. And then they'll fly off with my goods and I'll take their money. And that's, that's what I want. And that's why mm. I'm so glad that the, the fact that you can now, well, early 2021, you're going to be able to land on a planet, maybe jump out, go and go and meet up with someone and do a really shady Tritium deal or something. Yeah, who and knows? That's what we want. Like they, they might even have like first person combat in there as well to make it feel a bit more like an actual, you know, full on RPG in a way. By the look yeah. of the trailer, it seems as though you're going to have some sort of weapon. Mm, yeah. Um, when they're, they're walking around, they're, I mean, they're holding something, aren't they? I hope so. they have more variety than, like, No Man's Sky. Um, and that you just have, like, one... I mean, I'm saying this based on what I've seen from my mates playing No Man's Sky and not actually me playing the game. It, it does sound like it's turned into a good game nowadays, but... Um, it's more like um, Astroneer or something like that, or one of the Steam games in a way, um, where you just have like one tool to use, which I guess is easy. But you know, people like me like variety. I yeah, I, I don't want to. I don't want my game to be solely based on I can only do this. I can mm. do that. I want. I want to then say, go. Oh, you know what? I fancy being a smuggler today. I'll be. I'll be a soldier tomorrow that's what yeah. i want from a game i want i want the idea i could suddenly switch up and be something mm. else unfortunately not all games hit the mark on that and no it's, it's a hard with, one with games like like elite dangerous like star citizen like you look at your other mmos you want to be able to have that that sort of ability to change like what you do like you look at world of warcraft like i have like obviously you choose your, your class and you choose like your race as well yeah but you can still spec those to a completely different variety say one day i want to be a, a hunter with with a bow in in five levels time i might decide i want to use a blunderbuss and i can and that's what you need from that sort of game is the variety yeah yeah and games like no man's sky i don't think hit the mark on that it does like you say it sounds a lot better it sounds as though they've listened to the fans, which is exactly what you want. Mm. It just feels a bit procedurally generated, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, kind of like Elite, in a way. A lot of that, their stuff is procedurally generated. But it's it's in a more realistic way. They don't have as much variables, especially when it comes to like life forms and whatnot. Um, you know, when you've, when you've seen like the same gangly-looking deer running around like, for the fifth time, it kind of feels a bit immersion-breaking. Whereas Elite, in a way... Um, you can see patterns such as you know where planets and whatnot look the same but um you know that they're all slightly different and you know that the number of planets in this in the galaxy in the milky way are so numerous that you're gonna come across ones that look similar it's it is a good thing um i think that it's like like you say it's it's very it it is procedurally generated but it's to a, a good degree that you're not as you're not as as 
tied down to each one of those planets that you come across that might look the same as the one previously. Mm. Whereas I feel like with No Man's Sky you are because yeah. you you land on one planet, it's it's it looks like the first one you ever landed on. You might go five, six more planets and land on another one that's the exact same. <laughs> you you're just doing the same thing over and over. And yeah. I mean I've I've never played No Man's Sky, I can't lie yet, but I feel like the story maybe isn't as much there for you like you mm. haven't got the the direct notion that i have to do this I have maybe to do what that. i need to do is just play the game you know yeah, maybe yeah. maybe we both need to have a crack at it and then we can give it an actual yeah. blast yeah that's one thing that you know um uh you know it's just a good advice for anybody really you know just actually try it you know don't listen to us. Uh, yeah, you might don't, find that don't listen no to our ill-informed opinions. Just... You might find that No Man's Sky is the greatest game ever, and that's what you know. As, as long as you're happy playing watching. what you're playing, that's mm. fine. But I don't think it's like for us. I don't think we should be against criticizing what we see as as something that needs to be there, and that's that's probably mainly what this podcast chat show is. It yeah. a chat show, talk show. We're learning. We're learning. We're figuring out. Yeah, well, I think I think the key thing is that from here on in, we we look at games that either we have played or we, whether we haven't played it, but because it's not come out or what, we we have a look. And I I reckon personally, we'll probably present more. James might play a game one week, and I'll listen to to what his opinion is, and and he'll tell me what game he's playing, and I'll mm. I'll have a see what I think of it as well. Um, oh, I know yeah. one game James hasn't. I don't. Well, I don't think you've played it. Warzone, Call of Duty. I have it on my PC because it's free to download. But uh, my PC is in dire need of an upgrade, and uh, I've not really been that inspired to play it because of the fact it runs like shit. Um, kind of like PUBG in a way. But um, it's a game that I've been keeping up to date with. Um, I've been watching a lot of videos online. I've been reading a lot of articles and whatnot. And well, to some extent. I could be a little bit better, and I will be by some point in the future. But yeah, it, I've been keeping up to date with a lot of it. It looks like a fun game, and I think Warzone has uh, filled a niche that a lot of games haven't really in a while. I I uh, have played it, and I've streamed it a couple of times uh, on my Twitch channel. Yeah. Um, I do enjoy Warzone. I'm terrible at it. I it's a lot of fun. It looks the, like a good game. The highest... Uh, area I've actually been at is I, I was one of the last two and got killed by the other guy oh. but it's because I sat camping constantly now oh, yeah, the, camping. the thing with uh, with Warzone to me it seems as though you've got to be constantly run and gunning mm-hmm. that's that's probably my only it's like real life phone. it's like yeah. um, you know any any kind of mission you can't stay in the same place at, you know at the same time um, you know I play a lot of PUBG and um even though my PC runs it kind of shitly, I still try my best to play, and I'm all right at it. I'm pr- I'm fairly decent at shooters. I'm not terrible, but I've played them for quite a long time, and I've got a bit of experience. And, um, you know, camping just isn't the way to go. You can sit in one place for twenty, thirty minutes in PUBG and, and not see anybody, and then venture outside and be the unlucky cunt who ends up getting sniped in one go <laughs> by some master. Because there I, uh, are some good players out there. The only time I've played PUBG is when they did the PUBG mobile thing. And <laughs> yeah. I, I think I've, <laughs> I've, on there, like if you look at my record, I think I've out of the four games I've played, I've got three winner winners. All right, really? Yeah. But it's because on, on mobile it's so... In reality, if you, you, down quite you know what case. you're looking for, like if you know who you're looking for, how you're, you're looking to play, mm. it's such an easy game to play. And that's that's the thing. Like The mm. the only time that I didn't get the winner-winner was when I was in the last... Like It was, again, a case like Warzone. I was yeah. in the last two and I got beat by the other guy. Oh, mate, yeah. It's tense when it gets to the last ring, when it gets right to the yeah. end. It's a great gameplay mechanic that I think is it's so addictive and there's a reason why it's so popular nowadays. Battle Royales have really changed the game. Yeah. Like, they, they're games now... I think more people want Battle Royales than they don't. Like You know what yeah. I've been playing recently? I, uh, I've got a Switch... Nintendo Switch. Switches are, in my opinion, the, the greatest console to have come out in a long Fantastic time. Fantastic console. Yeah. It's, it's a genius idea. If I've you got friends want who love to, them. If you want to play like with a couple of friends, you have a couple of friends over or whatever, you want to play, I think the Switch is fantastic. Yeah. 
it's so well made for like co-op gameplay. It's it seems to cater for everything that like the the true gamer wants. Like you know you can there's lots of versatility. You can you can pull the Joy Cons off and um, the controllers off, and uh, you know you can play in all sorts of different ways. You can play on the little screen wherever you want around the house. You can sit in your bed and play, or you can you can play it with your friend like in the same room with two different screens. Or you can play on one screen on your big screen. You can connect it all up with the HDMI cable. And it is it you is can, an actual fantastic yeah, bit of kit. I think versatility. this is this is where like Nintendo had that such a good period where they were like, oh yeah, we're gonna knock out like the GameCube. We're we're gonna knock out this. We're gonna knock out that. Mm. Then they they slumped in reality. Pro and and I know people love them, but I think the Nintendo Wii was the place where they were like. Yeah. On, on a slow decline. Yeah, then they it went, felt a bit gimmicky, didn't it, yeah. in my opinion? Like, and it was then fun they went, to play as kids. But... Oh, we'll, we'll do a Wii U. And that was poor as well. Yeah, the Wii U, though. I've, I've got a few friends who love the Wii U or loved the Wii U when it came out. Because the games that came out on that were really good. And, you know, it's a good console, too, not going to lie. Um, but it just got out competed by everything else that came out at the same time so much. And But the Switch has just done what the Wii U did, but much better. It's got, you know, the same style games. The Switch also, one of the best things about it, about Nintendo in general, is that they allow backwards compatibility for practically all of their games. You yeah. can play Game Boy games on the Switch. Um, you I can plug know. a Game Boy cartridge into the Switch. Huh? They've got, like, a, a, a way to play almost every single kind of game, uh, Nintendo game, on the Switch. You can play, I think, I'm not sure if you can play, like, the... Uh, DS games or not? I've not asked about that, but um, I know, don't think you can. Just do things I've, like that. I've I've got a, a 3DS and yeah. a DS. Um, I, I think maybe it's because 3DSs are still quite popular in a way. Yeah, but, I I yeah. honestly I I could not be happier with with, and I'm surprised because I used to be a, an Xbox fanboy through and through. Yeah, through same. I, I had Xbox. I played PS3 for a while. I played PS4 for yeah. a while, and I I hated them both, so I got rid of them both. Oh. But the Xbox One I've got there. It's it's actually in the room just, we're in yeah, now. Just in on top of a cupboard doing nothing. Um, but <laughs> my my Switch it's it's in a drawer uh, somewhere. It made, I've I've only just moved into this house, so it's uh, everything's still up in the air about where it is. But mm. I loved the Switch. Like I completed Pokemon Shield um, a couple of weeks ago. Finished it all. For me, like I used to, I used to buy a Pokemon game and decide, oh yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blast this out. I'll get through it all, and then I'll move on to the next one. Yeah. I thought, oh, I'll, I, I want to see how quick I can beat this. Yeah, I, yeah. I want to do it like that. But with Pokemon Shield, I found myself sitting there and thinking, you know what? I'm gonna enjoy this. I'm gonna enjoy. I've got 27 hours on mm. the game because I didn't want to stop exploring stuff like. I was beating gyms and things like that, and I thought, oh, yeah, it's a great this. But then I'd be like, right, I want to export Wild Area. I want to have a look at what this is. I want to I want to talk to every person I can because it was the first time I've ever seen a an actual Pokemon game, not, like, disregarding, like, Pokemon Coliseum and games like that, mm. but this was the first time I'd ever seen a Pokemon, Pokemon game actually on the television and I was like I want to do this I want to do that mm. I played I played Pokemon Shield like HD. I did Skyrim yeah I explored everything <laughs> and I found more things than I thought were possible and wow. it was a wonderful world yeah and I've you know I can't really say much about that because I've never really been a big fan of Pokemon I was when I was a kid but I never got the chance to really play the game I remember I got Pokemon Sapphire for the Game Boy SP and I lost the cartridge after a few weeks of having it. And I never played Pokemon again until I got Pokemon... Uh, I think it was... You know the Diamond and Pearl? Yeah. I have a Pearl one. I played that for like a couple of times when I was in school. I think it was when I was still in like, sec like primary school. I think you had Pearl at the same time I had Pokemon yeah. Diamond. Yeah. And my, my brother, Keegan, who I, I grew up with James and... Mm. And obviously, well, there was me, James, and my brother Keegan. Mm -hmm. Keegan had Pokemon Pearl. I had Pokemon Diamond. And obviously, you had Pokemon Pearl about the same time. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. 
I don't think there was ever, like, I, I'd always noticed that, is there was never that attraction to Pokemon for you. Like, I reckon it, yeah. was, it was more of a, like, oh, yeah, everyone's on that, and then you're mm. like, mm, not as bothered. There was a time when I liked it a bit, and that was when I uh, found the Pokemon Arena, was it? Like, the online arena? Oh, yeah. Where you could play with online people on the PC, and you were in, like, a... Um, all I remember is that you were inside like a, a cave or some kind of map and you'd just walk around and it was like a lobby of like hundreds of people cramped into like one room and that's all I remember about it and I remember playing it quite a lot and I loved it but um, I had a, never uh, got a chance to move on. I found a Pokemon game that was online and uh, you, you basically walked around the map and Drink of this Brooklyn Lager, Brooklyn Pilsner. Yeah, mm. we had the Brooklyn Naranjito before this. Yeah, starting oh, to feel it a bit now. Fantastic. Yeah, I was about to say um, the same thing. Not much of a drinker anymore. <laughs> like, coronavirus has meant that we can't really go out a lot. And, you know, the, the alcohol tolerance that I had from uni a few years ago has gone away. And, um, you know, I've just got to the point where after a few pints, I'm pretty damn buzzed. It's, uh, it's not yeah. the worst thing though, is Which it? Which is good, yeah. It's definitely uh, I, I yeah, think it's cheaper. <laughs> alcohol in no way is like a good habit to have, really. No. <laughs> I mean, it's good. it makes awesome memories, but, you know, uh, that's about it. Yeah, I, I completely agree and with And also, you. you know, it can taste very delicious. There, there are some beers that are very nice. There are some beers oh, that are rancid, really? but... Yeah. It, it depends what you're, all, best. you're looking for uh, in a beer. <laughs> like, there's, there is... I, and I know that I mean we taste of Batman it's pretty nice we might have listeners that, that end up um, you know being, being big Carlin drinkers but yeah I can't sit and drink a Carlin I cannot no. like I, I have sipped Carlin before and just it just tastes like piss, piss. yeah <laughs> exactly it's, it's, it's what comes not, out of his mind it's about a 2% beer it's and not it's, a 4% isn't yeah. it yeah and it, it just it's made in the cheapest way possible it's probably, I mean, to be honest, and I can guarantee that anybody who works for Carling is going to say that their beer's pretty good. And it probably is made to, like, a good recipe, as all beers are in the UK. It's just, you know, there's only so tasty that you can make fermented wheat water taste. <laughs> fermented you know I mean? wheat water. Like, yeah, when you think about that, like, when you think about it as, like, an ancient drink that's been around for, like, tens of thousands of years, or, or maybe, like, it's wheat water. just a few thousand years... Um, you know, we, we've perfected it from like what you probably used to taste like absolute shit into something that's quite nice. And you know, there's the cheap stuff and there's the good stuff, as, as anything is. Of course. And the cheap stuff tends to be a bit naff. See, that's mm. that's my problem with uh, with Carlin is I can go into into a, a Weatherspoons, for example. I can I can sit there and I can think. Oh yeah, I would uh, say for example a pint of punk IPA. I'm yeah. I'm big on brew dog. I'm sure yeah, pretty good with them and stuff like that. Not so <laughs> yeah. so I'm I'm a good sponsor brew dog one day. <laughs> brew dog, you come and sponsor us. But on, on a serious level, I've I've got shares in brew dog. Uh, my dad bought them for me, and and like I get discounts with them. Wow, I but yeah. I'm not I'm not purely an advocate because of that. I, I have loved BrewDog since I first ever found out about it. A friend of mine called Harley, he introduced it to me um, for the first time probably about 2014, 2015, maybe the latest. And yeah. How old were you then? You'd have been about like... About uh, 19, I think. Yeah, yeah. 19, 20, about well, that time. I'm 25 now, yeah. but... Yeah. yeah, I just hit 23 a few weeks back, or over a month now. God, it feels like Old two days man. ago. Yeah. You are currently the same age as my girlfriend. Yeah. She uh, she turned twenty. I feel old, but I know a lot October. of people who are older than me would say like, "Oh, you, you young bastard, you got so much life out of you." But but humans live for a very long time, and you know. At the end of the day, life is what you make of it. If you sit around and say, oh, "I'm gonna be," I'm I'm gonna morph into an old bastard then you will that's, yeah. that's the fact like, I've got a friend who says he's going to be a grumpy old man when he's older and I, it probably will be true it's so odd because I've yeah. I've watched my dad like and it's probably probably because of his jobs and stuff um, I've watched him be like grumpy and, and old and like yeah. it, at 40 he was a lot older than he is now and he's 50 
Yeah. Like, ten years ago, for my dad, like, he was older than he is now. And I know yeah. that doesn't make sense, but in if you... I, I have always said this. If you think of yourself as young, then your body will say you are young. Like, my dad now looks... My dad now yeah. looks younger than he did at 40. Yeah. Probably younger than he did at 35. Yeah. But that's because in his head, like, because he's constantly, like, having a joke, having a laugh, rather than rather than being serious about everything, mm, mm. he looks younger. Takes a load off you, doesn't yeah. it? Makes you feel better. And I think that's the key thing that people don't realise is if you, if you want to live your life as an old person, in your head, if you say, I am old, I'm going to be this you'll end up getting wrinkles way before somebody that's... Like, say, for example, you might... Be, Stress does a lot to you, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You might be 30 now thinking, oh, I'm going to be an, an old fucker, I'm going to have wrinkles. You'll start getting them. If you if you are, say, for example, like my dad, 50 years old, that man's got about four wrinkles, and that's no joke. My dad's got about four wrinkles, but when he was mm-hmm. 40, he had about 25 of them. Yeah. It's, yeah. he's, he's lost weight, he goes to the gym four or five times a week Probably now. gets a bit sun, I reckon, yeah. Yeah, he, he tries to go on holiday at least two or three times a year. Yeah. He gets himself, he looks after himself because I think he got to a point where he was like, no, I'm not going to be a, an old man. I'm not going to be an old, old man. I'm going to be a young, <laughs> old man. Yeah. And it's yeah. it's odd. I, I actually work for my dad's best friend, Graham, um, and he is the exact same as my dad. He is... He's 53. He's like, like he's not an old 53. He looks young for his age. Yeah. If, you, if someone, if you would say, oh, how old is he? You'd think, oh, yeah, put 40, maybe. You'd mm. knock 10 years off the boat for him, at least. Genetics only takes you so far. Uh, yeah. If you look after yourself, uh, you know, you, you keep your hair in check, you moisturise your skin, especially, you know, cocoa butter and stuff like that, <laughs> that helps. You know, yeah, you will look younger for longer. You know, as soon as you start letting go of yourself, that's when, you know, things start to go a bit awry. See, I I sort of got onto this subject on, on the basis that, that we maybe do talk about looking after yourself. Like, yeah. James James is a vegan. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not a full-time pescatarian. I do still eat the occasional bit of meat. But mm-hmm. I my eating is probably more fish-based than it is actual meat now. Um, mm. And personally, I think... I think if you were actually, I'm not saying a vegan diet is the most healthy style of diet because there is vegan junk food and, yeah. and I'm sure James will admit there's there's good vegan food, there's bad vegan food, just like with anything. If you eat fried tofu and like, you know, uh, I know some people who are vegans and only eat, uh, you know, sausages like, you know, and burgers all day and, you know, chips and, you know, still have a bit of belly and all that, you know, it's just... You know, it's it's not hard to to like whether you you are someone that that shoveling trans fats down your throat, yeah. or if you if you're constantly having the saturated fats and all your bad stuff. It whether you you're a vegan, whether you're, mm. you're vegetarian, whatever your diet is, if you still keep shoveling all that bad food down your throat, and I'm guilty of it. I know I am because you're all, surprised at what's good for you though. To be honest. Yeah. You know, some, a lot of saturated fats, especially plant fats, you know, uh, olive oil, uh, peanut oil, like peanut butter, um, you know, uh, things like that. You know, sunflower oil, rapeseed oil, they're pretty good for you. And, you know, in moderation, they keep your heart healthy sometimes, you know, and fish as well, especially keeps your yeah. brain healthy as well. It's the you know, uh, uh, thing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fish oil. Omega-3. Yeah. It's got something to do with the fact that um, omega-3, um, I'm not sure whether it's omega-3 specifically, but some fats, healthy fats, line the nerve endings and keep them uh, from breaking down. And having a healthier nervous system keeps your brain and body and your whole nervous system, including the brain and body, working better, being more of like a well-oiled machine in a way. When you don't have that, it doesn't have the means to produce that like healthy nerve ending and then begins to break down. And that's when you get things like uh, cramps and, uh, you know, muscle pains and that and even brain fog. And, you know, all kinds of symptoms that, you know, that arise from just having a bad diet. And, you know... See, that's what... Master Fairbairn's always had it ages ago, you know. Food is medicine, you know. If you have a good diet, then you'll yeah. be healthy. 
See, this is what I was, I was just going to say, is so many people say, oh, I find it so hard to eat, eat on a diet, I find it so hard to do this, I find it so hard to do that. I think the problem is, if you force yourself into a diet, then mm. you don't want to do it mentally. It's, it's all in the it's brain, isn't it? more about, if you say, for example, if you know you're eat, sat there eating a burger and chips four out of the seven days a week, mm. then... Maybe stop doing that. Yeah, it's it's as simple as that. Like, don't diet. Like, I'm not on a diet, and and I know I'm, not, I'm technically not on a diet. I, I know. Myself on a diet. I know. Like during lockdown, I put so much weight on. Like, I've mm. gone up to to like bear in mind Whereas before got a bit me. <laughs> before <laughs> lockdown, I, I was sixteen stone. Yeah, yeah. During lockdown, I've gone to gone up to eighteen stone. Yeah, like, that's two stone I've put on in in space of roughly five months because. Yeah. I didn't realise what I was eating. Like I didn't sit back and think, oh yeah, I'm 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 probably eating badly there. I need to stop mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas now I realise, as long as I I eat within moderation, I'm not sat eating a takeaway every every other night. I'm mm-hmm. not like what I've found about living living with Millie is we tend to eat proper food now. Like yeah. before, we'd overplate ourselves food. Yeah, like we'd be like, oh yeah, let's let's cook a, a garlic bread, and then we'd be like, yeah, we'll do we'll do a pack of chips as well. Oh, uh, yeah, we might as well do a sausage or two with it as well, and that'd be the thing like it's spiraling like out of control. Yeah, night, yeah. <laughs> and that that was where I was going wrong. I realised now, like even though some sometimes I'll eat I'll eat a full meal and I'd be like, right, I'm hungry again. Like the other night, I had a bird's eye fish pie. Mm. 337 calories in the whole pie it was that's not a lot it wasn't massive yeah but i ate that as as my evening meal and thought you know what that's all right and i was hungry after it and i knew yeah. i was hungry but that's you know, but i didn't room think more, haven't you? i didn't think oh i'm gonna go and i'm gonna go and buy another one i'm gonna cook another one i thought that is an average size meal for a normal person mm. like that's the thing like in in my head so often i think Oh yeah, wait. Uh, I'm I'm gonna eat this. I'm I'm gonna eat that. I'm gonna keep eating stuff. If you cut down your consistent eating, you're fine. Like if like I've just said, if you eat a burger and chips, like three out of the seven days a week, mm. you you're probably gonna put weight on. If you cut that down to having one burger a week and alternating those those other meals with with like say for example for for mine and James as as tea or snack in a while, I bought some sweet potato burgers. Oh yeah, yeah. So looking forward to eating them too. We're gonna have sweet potato burgers, and with, with whatever on it, and that'll be a, it. It won't be a full meal. It'll be more of a snack, a bowl. Yeah, light lunch. It's that's that's the difference. If you're if you're deciding to eat more and more and more and more all the time, you're gonna put weight on. If you alternate those those burger and chips that you're eating with an alternative burger, admittedly it's still a burger, but. You might change it for something vegetable based. You might change mm. it for something that's not as as fatty. And that's if you start doing that, it makes you, a big difference. Yes, yeah. it's that is the the shocking thing about it. Or if you're willing to make the change and move different sort of foods into your diet, you will lose mm. weight. And that is a fact. Like yeah, and it, it it takes a long time. The biggest thing that a lot of people have about dieting is that they want results instantly. They want to lose weight. Mm-hmm. They want to lose a stone within a month or whatever, or you know, within two months in time for this or that or this or that. But the truth is that it takes a long time. I went from eighteen stone to, let's say, when I, I like to mark it to when I left uni. When I um, left school, when I joined college, when I was in like, let's say, when I was about 17, I was about 18 stone, I didn't lose any, I didn't make any serious gains until I was about 21. Like, you know what I mean? I didn't yeah. notice, I didn't feel that I was actually thin until I was 21. But, um, you know, that it took, it was a learning process. It took a long time. I had to learn how to cook for myself. You know, I was no longer eating food from home. I was buying my own food, which definitely helps. If you're in control of the food that you eat, then it's a lot easier to diet. If you're, um, you know, at home living with somebody else and they have a bad eating habit, then it's a lot harder. Yeah. You have to persuade them to do it with you 
or you have to have that level do of extra willpower work, and yeah. say, in my head, I am going to be. It takes this. years. Yeah, it could take years to lose the, the right amount of weight that you want to do. But it's. I always find that dietary like mm-hmm. problems come from the fact that the people have got learned habits from maybe the parents that they've lived with or roommates. Yeah. Like like you've just been saying, say for example, like my like entire childhood, like I was eating like. Admittedly, my, my dad did admit Scotch to... Scotch pies, beans, like chips. That sort of stuff, yeah. Yeah, garlic, Kiev's... Yeah, uh, lasagna that probably weren't the best lasagna mm. that could be. It wasn't probably wasn't cooked fantastically. Mm. Uh, shepherd's pies, all these sort of hearty meals that would be perfect for, as it's called, a shepherd. Yeah, or, or shepherd's somebody pie. who works out quite a lot. Yeah, yeah if someone if you, that's actually doing something like out in the field, doing this, doing that, like... Doing a lot of exercise. Don't get me wrong. Work. I am. I'm probably the most culturally in touch person when it comes to food. Like I love <laughs> food from different cultures. But if I'm eating a lasagna, which is probably like the equivalent of a of a, an Italian shepherd's pie, or whatever. Yeah, and it's probably not even like an actual real Italian recipe. Yeah, yeah. no, exactly. And that's <laughs> that's the thing. You you want to like. You end up learning what you're... I don't know. Yeah, I, it, I don't want to tell... Like, yeah, Italians get Italian. quite sensitive about it, don't they? <laughs> right, lasagnas <laughs> are real. <laughs> they do exist. It's the same with Korean. Lasagna is real. Yeah, it's the yeah. same with curry in England. You know what I mean? Curry in England is so much different to what they eat yeah, in India. But that's because... In in India, it, like their their spice mixers are, are a lot better, a lot stronger. And, yeah, a lot stronger. But they don't <laughs> tend to be as spicy in India mm. because the the thing is, I I once read about it. In fact, no, I didn't read about it. A, a lad I used to work with, he was he was a, an Indian guy, and he he his dad owned a, a curry shop. Mm. Oh, and, man. Uh, what a dream! <laughs> yeah, <no>. beautiful. <laughs> like, imagine get to like go to your dad's curry house all the time. Yeah, you know? no. The thing but is, he he yeah. said that the the thing is, every Englishman wants to sit around and brag about how he can sit and eat a vindaloo and mm. oh, I can shovel pure chili into my nostrils and <laughs> stuff like that. Yeah, that's the that's the difference between it's like a almost like a toxic masculinity yeah. in a way, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah. It, it, it is. Yeah. Whereas in in India. They're, they're not bothered about like that they level They probably of, eat of chili time. for like its medicinal benefits yeah. or for the fact it's... that it makes the food taste delicious or, you know. <laughs> I mean, this is just a rumour, but um, it's probably not based in truth either. But I have a friend who says, who swears outright, that the fact that the only way that Indians who live on the Ganges River can drink the Ganges water is because they eat all those digested spices like, you know, turmeric and cascudi yeah. methane and all that. You know, that's <laughs> probably not far off. It's probably, it's... Yeah, you know, it's probably true to an extent. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you lived in Delhi, I doubt you'd better drink the Ganges there or, you know, wherever. Oh, yeah. But, like, upstream, maybe. But, you know, yeah, it's, it's a strange fucking... Yeah, like, like I was saying, the, the guy I worked with, he said, every, every Englishman wants to brag that he can... He can eat a vindaloo and, and what have you. Yeah. And admittedly, it's probably... I've never had a vindaloo on the basis I don't want to have absolute ring sting the next yeah. time. But the thing yeah. is, Indian Indian people, whether they spice the food to, to a spicy degree or not, it's because they want to taste the flavours. Mm. English people don't. English people want to be sat there looking in a mirror, eating a vindaloo, staring at themselves like... Sweating s- like fuck with like red face. Snaffling the food, probably <laughs> drinking a can of Carlin, thinking yeah, that they're like the biggest, lager. hardest man in the world. <laughs> they're usually bold, and that's no offence to us, our bold fans. To be honest, bold, being bold is a fucking, you know, it's a, I think more people should be bold. I, I went bold at the start of... Lockdown. Oh, Shaved all my I hair off. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. Um, I did that just because I wanted to see what it'd be like. But did you uh, like it or did you hate it? No, I hate it. Oh. I've I've got my hair back now and I'm yeah. like, oh, it's so good. Yeah. But I thought about it once, uh, just out of curiosity as well. But you know, I like my hair too. If you've got a good if you've got a good head of hair, then keep it. You know, I, you know, I agree with that 100%. If you want to be bold, then go bold, because it can sometimes look awesome. You know, sometimes, you know, people like it because it's practical or because it can, it means you don't have to wash the hair or well, uh, some people do the, it because... Uh, the, the scans we've had, uh, me and Millie, for our son, um, yeah. who 
will be born in October at some point. Yeah, God, that's not very far away, is it? He has got the thickest head of black hair. Whew. Also, they're saying it, it's... Just, poof. Wow, man. So it's amazing when babies are born with like thick heads of hair because nobody in my family was ever born with a thick head of hair. See, I was born yeah. with a with a, a good head of hair. Yeah. My dad's my dad's very got <coughs> very good hair, so it probably probably follows the genes and stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's it's very exciting. But yeah, I I think people that that are bald and and do enjoy having a bald head. Uh, a very I don't know brain thing some ways in my opinion and I read a thing once um, but it was almost like a joke once it said somebody who who is who is thinning or has a receding hairline um, when they shave their head to go bald they're saying to the devil that I am still in control of my own destiny <laughs> yeah <laughs> I like that yeah. I like that <laughs> I do think I it does baffle me sometimes, like, and and don't get me wrong, people people have however hair however they want, but yeah. when when people start to like really recede to like a point where it's halfway at the back of the head, Patrick Stewart, you know, he's like, why don't you just shave it all off? Why? Because cool. there's got to be a level of pride to you still, even if your head hair is all the way back there. I, I don't think you can pull off any look if you're not bald. Unless you've got an absolutely awesome skull, like Patrick Stewart, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is a good example. Yeah. But not Very everyone's Patrick Stewart. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like me, you know, I've got bumps all over my skull because, you know, my surgery, but, yeah. you know. Uh, you Which know. is something we will probably cover on our next podcast. Yeah, maybe, um, maybe. But yeah, it's a good story I to tell. think we are going to take a break. We will record some more after the break, but we're both out of beer and, uh, and coffee. That coffee hit hit well. That not going to lie. Out of beer, out of coffee, and I'm getting quite hungry. So we'll be back shortly after the break. We'll probably cover some more bollocks. Right. Hello, hello. Welcome back to in the cubby hole with Niall and James. We did just take a break. We had some delicious sweet potato burgers and uh, sank a few more beers. Yeah. So and now we are fairly it. lubricated on the ale front. So we did say, obviously, we, we've gone through a lot of subjects, um, varying from everything. I think. Yeah, we spoke about you know gaming. We spoke about diet. We've spoken about uh, a little bit about mental health and whatnot. Uh, we've spoken about uh, you know a lot about diet actually as well. That's probably a big thing. Uh-huh. Um, what next? Still, let's have a look at our range of subjects. We've got um, history, positive mental attitude, general news. In reality, I'm, I'm, I mean, it is always going to be me and James co-hosting this, but. James is very good when it comes to, to geology, and he went to uni to study that. I, however, remained a bomb mm-hmm. and ended up working in call centres for the majority of my working career. Um, I do now work... <laughs> well, it takes a long time to find a right job. I, got, I went to uni, and you know, even now, I don't really have a job in geology, so things don't always turn out the way you want them to but you know um it's a work in progress you know you've got to find the right thing for you see i i now work in uh, a job in garage equipment which is what my dad's always done um since he were 18 he's been working working in uh, garage equipment so i now test the cables that go into uh two and four post lift for cars which is actually what I've always wanted to do not the testing part but I've always wanted to be in garage equipment so I'm finally in that however not bad as I said James is is good when it comes to geology so I'm going to hand it over to him and let him let him have a bit of a chat about it um on the basis that I mean what we're going to do from now until the future is me and James co-hosting however we will sometimes have special guests so it'll be my friends his friends Mm-hmm. Um, family, things like that. We'll have a few different people on. Um, but in this respect, we are going to make James our special guest and also our co-host, so he can tell us a bit more about his specialist subject, which is in reality, geology. Yeah, and I could waffle on about it for quite a while. Um, there's a fair few things I could dig in and you know to talk about. But is there anything in particular that you've always wanted to know? 
See, for me, because you sort of give me little bits and bats of information, usually when we're in the pub and mm. drunk. Um, but no, I, I think if you if you sort of give a, a general overview to to our listeners, yeah, uh, what what geology is, what it entails, because I, I, I'm not quite sure everyone knows what it is. Sure. Um, well, geology, um, in, in its name really, is the study of the earth or earth science. Um, that's kind of like the English name for it. Geo meaning is Latin for the earth or of the earth and ology meaning the study of in a sense probably not 100 percent right but it's, it basically means the study of the earth or there science. and thereabouts um geology itself covers quite a lot of subjects um you can be a geologist in many fields um most universities around the country do a a um a degree in geology but um some will do quite a few different topics so for example where i went to the university of brighton um, which is where I lost my a bit of my accent from. <laughs> um, they did a, a just a broad a BSc geology course, which is like a broad subject covering quite a lot of things, going from geochemistry all the way to the structure of the earth itself, um, all the way to engineering, mining, and um, you know construction and things like that. But you can specialise in some subjects as well as a geologist, um, especially if you go into a masters. Um, a lot of jobs in geology pay really well because they're quite um, in demand. It is very competitive as well, though, so unless you have a specific goal in mind, um, you will have to really kind of work quite hard or work from the beginning if you want to uh, work as a geologist. But um, to anybody who is quite fascinated in, in the scientific subjects, wants to get a good job that will get them outside and travel the world, um, I'd recommend it. Um, it's a pretty good subject. And it's pretty fascinating, even though I don't have a job in geology myself now, I may get one in future, um, I still really remember and admire a lot of the topics and it has changed the way I view the world forever. Whenever I go outside now, um, I think about, um, I tend to have thought chains on where things originate, even down to where bricks in the building comes from, or where the coal comes from that you put in your fire, if you still do have a coal fire. It's a very routine And, now, isn't it? Um, you know, um, when you see like a natural formation, like a, a cliff or a, a beach or, um, you know, even a hill or a mountain, there's a lot to unpack concerning the geology itself and the history of the place. I myself um, did my dissertation in Snowdonia where I looked at a place called uh, Difrim Mimbir, which so is Wales. A, a valley um, not far from Mount Snowdon itself. Um, they had a mountain on the side of the valley called Moyel Shabod, which is where the centre of my mapping area was and the rest of it kind of extended around it. Um, I spent five weeks there um, mapping the the um, you know the the landscape around it and trying to figure out um, how where the rocks came from, what their original environment on the Earth was like about four hundred million years ago, and then figuring out how after they'd been laid down and turned into rock um, by the natural processes of of weathering or not weathering but deposition and then changed by tectonics and by erosion over millions of years into what they are now. Uh, it, it's a great subject. And if you like, you know, the outdoors, like I said earlier on, it's pretty good. Um, field work's particularly interesting. If you do a degree in geology, you're guaranteed to go on uh, quite a lot of field trips. And depending on how friendly you are with your course mates, it's a great place, a great opportunity to... Um, to meet a lot of good friends. Um, my course in particular had about 50 people on it. It was quite a small course for a university, but because of the fact that we'd all got the chance to bond with each other over these field trips and over these experiences, over the nights out we'd had, you know, on, on the field trips themselves and outside of them, and the, the time we spent in uni together and the lectures and whatnot, it, it became a great little community of common study in a way. and. You know, it was an awesome time. One of the best times of my life, in my opinion. It was the only time whenever where I felt, pardon me, where I felt quite like, you know, I was part of a community of people who were looking to improve themselves. And it was really good. 
it's one of the reasons why I'd always recommend going to uni, even if you don't, you, you know, even if you don't really think that you're gonna get a certain job, it's worth going sometimes just for the experience, for the things that you'd learn and for the friends that you'd make along the way. What was it that got you into geology? Originally, um, I wanted to work in oil, in petroleum extraction, like my uncle. My mother's brother, um, youngest brother, is a uh, operations geologist for uh, BP. He's been in the oil industry for at least 20 years now, and even though the oil industry technically isn't really at the forefront of research nowadays, it's still quite a lucrative business. I myself don't really want to join the oil industry out of the fact that I don't believe that fossil fuels are a good way to create power anymore, especially because we have to worry about climate change and whatnot. But it's still an industry that's really large and it still will give you you know, a good lifestyle. There's a lot of good benefits to being in, in a fossil fuel um, geologist or an exploration geologist and you know it's pretty good most people start out being like a mud logger by going to um, an oil rig just like my uncle did working on an oil rig for a month at a time and a month off you'll start out by literally sifting through the remains that the um, that the drill will fetch up from deep within the earth and finding out whether that is um, you know a, a good um, like a, a, a lucrative resource to get out of the ground in a way and then you'll progress from there on to like a higher role you might become the you know not the manager but the well site geologist who um, oversees the drilling operation and from there you'll go to become something higher you might work in an office or um, you might end up becoming you know controlling a whole team of geologists who are underneath you and then going on to even higher positions so there's a lot of room for uh, for uh, progression in the oil industry it's, it's a good career to go for and I would recommend it if you <laughs> weren't like me and you weren't really you, you know you didn't really care about whether it was ethical or not in a way I mean oil, oil extraction now is becoming more clean than ever and it's becoming a lot more you know on a, on a serious level, what's the what say say for example, the, there are people listening that that mm. might want to go into to geology. Yeah. What is the what's what's the likelihood of getting a job in geology? I mean, obviously you, I'm not saying you've limited yourself, but mm. you've not not limited yourself by saying I won't do mm. geology. Uh, sorry, oil based stuff because of a little don't bit. Believe in it's. Yeah. It is true. I, I think nowadays though, the job market is quite competitive and unless you get a master's you'll have quite a hard time uh, applying for a job. It might take anywhere up to several years, up to about two years if you really worked hard at it to, to get an entry level job. Um, I think oil rigs are a pretty good way to start but uh, nowadays the majority of the geology um, job market is based on engineering and uh, large scale building projects. Because um, buildings that are large, like skyscrapers or mm. um, you know just large buildings, or even things like tunnels, bridges, uh, anything like that, anything that is a, a construction project that takes you know a long time and requires a lot of surveying, you need geologists to understand the the subsurface and to know that when you build that structure, it's going to be sound for years to come. Because, you know, like the old saying, if you build a house in the sand, it's going to eventually be washed down and fall apart into the sea. Um, you, you have to know what's underneath the ground before you build your foundations, before building is, is safe to build on. Some, there have been times in the past where foundations haven't been laid well and the building subsides and topples over. And that's millions and millions of pounds down the drain. So you need to have a good qualified geologist to scout out the area, to map the area to scan the subsurface using seismic uh, scanners and other things like uh, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, kind of like, you know, MRI machines. Yeah. They use that as well. They use um, other kind of resonance imaging as well, like they measure like gravity changes within certain areas of rock because denser rocks have a higher like gravitational field around them. Things like that. 
there's lots of ways that you can scan the subsurface and they use they're the primary tool that a geologist will use to to figure out whether the ground underneath them is good another thing is uh sometimes they'll build uh like pits trial pits as well and deep shafts even sometimes even tunnels um it takes a lot of work it's a lot of planning a lot of stuff like that and there's always a geologist on team on, on the team I, I would imagine that, that in reality geology is probably on, on the basis if you are on a, on a team like that mm. would it not be quite a dangerous task then because you are having to to, mm-hmm. to have those tunnels and things like that it is um, sometimes on large projects like building tunnels you can have uh, you know you can have tunnels um, collapse on you you know mm-hmm. you might hit a pocket of sand or a pocket of loose rock where as soon as you dig into it, it's going to fall straight down on top of you. Geologists and a lot of you know engineers have died on projects like this. I think the, the Channel Tunnel probably had a few deaths. Um, I know that uh, trial pits, when you dig a pit deep into the earth, like people tend to dig that by hand, and people have died in trial pits as well, literally by digging a hole and getting yeah. swallowed up by the earth and not being able to actually be dug out. Especially if it's like quite thick clay soil as well. Um, I, uh, so there I are don't dangers. Know how rather. correct it was in regards to the Channel Tunnel. Mm. I did read that the Channel Tunnel got delayed uh, due to the fact that they hadn't built the tunnels correctly on the French and the English side. Yeah. So they didn't they link up by about it, a foot. It was an international co- It, it yeah. wasn't like. They didn't. It wasn't one project. There were two projects going on at once yeah. with different countries, I think, and uh, they had to link up at the right time. And they probably would have messed it up a little bit. I do. Yeah, I believe it was. I think the Channel Tunnel was delayed by a year or so, two years maybe. Probably because it was it was out by a foot. A foot. Yeah. And all they would have had to do really would have been to kind of widen the tunnel so it connected up. Mm. But um, that even that even that one foot of space. When you have to dig all the way down and like connect it all together, um, you know, there's just lots of problems that can occur because rock is never like a single uniform unit under the ground. It's always like mashed up, and there's always like little pockets of like random things that just exist because of like some event that happened like millions of years ago that caused like a I don't know like gravel to fill into like a hole in under the sea or this or you know it's just all sorts of really complex like events and timelines that you have to unpack before you understand what's going on so it takes quite a lot of investigation and thought before you go into actually doing it you can yeah. never just dig a tunnel by like drilling into the ground the, unless it's like common uh, common belief the earth is mm. actually not flat and is very much uh, <laughs> quite messed up inside yeah uh, yeah yeah obviously you know the whole earth itself is is a huge rock but um most of that rock is like partially molten and you've got the core as well which is made out of solid iron heating up the rest of the earth and keeping you know the earth itself is like a almost like a ball of wax in a way with like a crust on the outside that's if the earth was the size of an apple the crust would only be about as thick as the skin of the apple Maybe a little bit more, like just a little bit more, like it's yeah, the uh, uh, thinnest. The crust of the Earth can be up to only several kilometers thick, especially at the base of the ocean. Yeah, I was going to say that. there's there's some parts of uh, yeah, I think it's Japan perhaps yeah. maybe where it's, it's like the Marianas Trench. Yeah. yeah, the the heat of the the water there, you know, as as it comes out of like say for example, you've got hot tap at home. Mm-hmm. They turn it on, it's borderline boiling. Yeah. Like already, and like without without the need of, say for example, you can you can buy uh, fishes and and taps now that allow you to have boiling water straight from the yeah. tap. However, there it's very much you turn hot water on and poof, it's yeah. boiling. Yeah, um, but the deep sea, the pressure of the water is so high that the water can be hotter than boiling. It can be at over a hundred degrees Celsius and not boil because the pressure wow. um, changes its state. The higher the pressure of the water, the harder it is to boil it. That's why if you take water right up to the top of Mount Everest, it boils at something like 90 odd degrees Celsius. 
because of the fact that there's less pressure up there. Yeah. Because there's not as much atmosphere pushing down on, on your position. So the water changes state a little bit easier in a way and boils easier. Whereas down at the bottom of the ocean, the water, especially around like um, volcanic areas, um, where the crust is splitting apart, like in the trenches and whatnot, um, you get the black smokers at the bottom of the sea. You get these like volcanic vents where like hot water and comes down from within the bottom of the crust and it erupts out in a way. The water there is like hundreds of degrees Celsius and full of like metals and minerals that like life thrives on, and that comes out like really hot and. Yeah, if you were to take that magically to the top of the surface, it would just instantly boil. And it, it's quite crazy. Because, as we know, the Earth is an ever-changing object. Crust is always being made. Like, you have that magma underneath the crust as well, the, um, well, not magma, but it's like, kind of like, squidgy, partial molten rock in the mantle. Um, that itself because it's lighter and less dense than the crust. You imagine like a bubble being caught underneath like the surface of the water. Yeah. You're holding it down. Or a beach ball, you think of it like that. It's less dense, the air is less dense than the water. The beach ball wants to like pull up. If you let go of that beach ball, the air inside the beach ball is gonna want to come to the surface where it's equal with the air around it. It's the same with the magma underneath the crust, with the mantle. That is less dense than the rock above it. And so it's always wanting to come to the air, which is, more equal in a way, it wants to reach an equilibrium and spew out in, as as magma. That's why volcanoes erupt because there's a pressure difference. Constantly there. Yeah, the, the always want to erupt up. You might. It's literally very much like holding a beach ball down and then like letting it go like, Oof, and then it comes up. Um, very much like that. And because there's pressure, and the pressure is higher in certain points on the Earth because of like a hotter bit of magma than somewhere else because of some force like a I don't know they call them mantle plumes it's only a theory but like hot spots exist in the mantle and that pushes up against the crust and that like pushes out pushes up through the mag the, the crust itself kind of like a you know a fist or a column yeah and it pushes it upwards and like pushes it outwards as it comes up kind of like you know it, it pushes it apart as it comes out that causes the ocean crust to spread and push outwards and widens the oceans in a way and that's what drives tectonic movement what mm. drives continental drift and because there's only so much surface on the earth that crust has got nowhere to go so it buckles up into other bits of tectonic plate other tectonic plates buckle into each other and that's what causes like the mountains and uh, and yeah, it's just lots of like complex processes. Yeah, on the earth, I could talk about it all day, but you know, <laughs> I want to keep the it's, topics to a point. It is, uh, yeah, it's mm. uh, it's very much uh, a special guest specialty. I mean, James, like I say, is a co-host. However, mm. in in regards to today, very much a uh, special guest. Um, one last thing before we we cut this. Any song recommendation? Choose one song that you've listened to recently. What would you recommend our viewers listen to? Ooh, uh, hmm. really recently. Let's have a think. The first one that comes into my head of the first album, I've been listening to a lot of Kendrick Lamar, mm. and he has an album really released a while ago based on the Black Panther film. Uh, Fantastic film. Yeah. Incredible. African Americans and any, any Africans really like vibe with Black Panther and uh, you know it, it would have been what inspired him to make the album no doubt and I've been listening to that a lot and I'd give it a listen if I were you. It's full of quite a lot of other stars as well. Quite a lot of popular musicians. Uh, I like to consider my music taste quite broad but you know, certain ones catch my eye every now and then, and I'll focus on them, and you know, move on to something next. In the so, meantime. the recommendation for this week is uh, the Black Panther soundtrack. I believe it is. Um, it's called technically uh, Black Panther <laughs> music from and inspired by by Kendrick Lamar. I give that a listen. It's pretty good. 
So jump on your Spotify or your Apple Play now and uh, go and give that a listen. And uh, right, I do think that's the end of, uh, of today's episode, this week's episode. Um, yeah, uh, whenever we next make another one, I'm sure we'll release it at some point and have it probably in a week or so. Easily maybe. accessible. Yeah, it will be. It will definitely be accessible on YouTube, and as soon as we find out how uh, how to actually put podcasts on perhaps Spotify or something like that, yeah, we'll uh, we will release it on there. So yeah, this has been into the cubby hole with Niall and James. Thank you for watching or listening. Drinking these Corona beers, <laughs> Corona time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you and goodbye.